All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm Chris Bernal with the Community Coordinating Council, and I'm the current chairperson of the Strengthening Muskegon Advisory Committee. And I'd like to welcome you to this community forum where we're gathering to discuss the wave of, or, excuse me, the recent violence that has occurred in our community. Um, the Strengthening Muskegon Project is funded by a grant from the Department of Health and Human Services. It's designed to provide training and resources to help us meet the needs of our community. The grant also provides technical assistance to faith-based and community organizations so that they can best meet those needs, thereby strengthening our community. My name is Bob Whitson. I'm the president and founder of the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. <clears throat> um, I started the center now 30 years ago. This is our 30th year. And uh, we were founded on the premise that that the problems facing, that you must look among the people suffering the problems for the solution. That's one of the premises. Um, there's a prayer that I utter each time that I speak and I commend to you. And I said, God, give me the strength to tell and pursue the truth, especially when it's inconvenient to me. Because uh, if you want to go someplace you haven't been, you've got to do something you haven't done. Or as my grassroots folks say, if you keep doing what you do, you keep getting what you got. And so what we are lacking in terms of addressing some of the problems of youth violence today is a lack of understanding for the need to be innovative and think outside of the box. Um, and also, some of us are trapped in our history, in our, in our experience. There was a story about a farmer who was taking his mule to market. And when he got to this stream, it was like three feet high, rushing at about 15 miles an hour. And so he had to force the mule in to get him across. And both of them were swept about a mile down the river. And finally, they, they, they crossed. <clears throat> a year later, the same farmer, same mule, came to the same crossing. This time, the water was only six inches high and the mule refused to go in because the mule had a good memory but poor judgment. So it is important for us not to be trapped by what happened in the past as we try to apply remedies that work then to circumstances that exist. We must apply new judgment. The problems of youth violence today are not what they were years ago. This is a whole different. Young people between the ages of 15 and 21 years old comprise only 9% of the US population. But they account for half of all property crimes and a fourth of all crimes of violence. So it's not a large cohort that we're talking about. And it doesn't take a large number of people to create a lot of havoc in our communities. And the problem was back in the, the prior to the 1960s, the family was the most stabilizing influence in our communities. The black community is often used as a moral barometer of the health of the community. Yet in 1962, 85% of all black families had a man and a woman raising children. And uh, we did not have this runaway violence that we have today because there is a direct link between the stability of the family and the presence of violence and crime in these communities. Today, that number has gone to 70% of children being born into families with a single parent. And one can see a, a, a correlation between that. And so we use that film, that video of 60 Minutes, as a powerful teaching tool because it is the principle of the violence-free zone. Because young people around the country, as I said, who are growing up like these young bulls, and they have reformed, the gangs are more important to them than their families. The gangs have become their families. And not all of them are members of formal gangs. Some of them are called crews, cliques. But nevertheless, there is, and what they find in the gangs is excitement, protection, a sense of belonging. Uh, and so everything that they find. And so what we did at the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise is in understanding that, ask ourselves, well, where should we find remedies that were similar to what 
these people in Kruger Park found. And I looked for it in my native Philadelphia that was the youth gang capital of America. We had 48 gang deaths a year, and, for, and people don't realize for every young person who is shot in a, in a gang murder, there are at least four that may be paralyzed for life. That's the ratio. Every time someone is killed, you can figure there are four that are injured and some of them for life. The McGee Memorial on the, uh, on the Parkway in Philadelphia is packed with young blacks in wheelchairs. And so what we did at, uh, is I looked for remedies among the people suffering the problem. And in my uh, old neighborhood, there was a, a woman named Sister Falaka Fatah and her husband David. Living in the midst of this chaos, she found out the oldest of her six sons was a gang member. So she told him to invite his friends to come and talk with them. So he brought 15 gang members' friends into their room, their house, and they sat up all night. She said, I guess what? I don't know anything about gangs, but I know something about family. So why don't you all move in with me? <laughs> she took out all the furniture and put mattresses all over this little house. And it's a row house. See, if you're rich, it's called a townhouse. <laughs> but if you're poor, it's a, it's a row house. Um, and so what she did was she said, if we're going to live like this, we all have to work, we have to be clean, we have to have order, and we have to make peace with the local gang. And they did. So that was the first truce. And so after a while, the word went out that there was sanctuary and there was a knock on her door every day because young people are always looking for sanctuary, but they're looking for a respectful way to achieve it. And so they retired her mortgage in two years, and within the next three years, they purchased five other houses on the block to accommodate the new people coming off the street. And then she said, well, there's peace in my neighborhood, but not in the city. So again, she is an entrepreneur, social entrepreneur. She took the unprecedented step to say, I want to reach out to active gang members throughout the city using the leadership that is here. And so she sought a venue. None of the black churches would give them a place. And, but the Quakers at 4th and Arch Street did. And so what she did was, and, and the city fathers canceled the Mummers Day Parade for the first time in the city's history. Because they said, if you bring these young people together, it's going to be chaos. Long story short, she brought them together. They signed a peace pact. And she began to work using the leadership of the gang in positive ways. And as a consequence of that, the city went from 48 gang deaths down to two in 1974. And it never went up after that. And so what I did was follow her around and wrote down everything she did. And I wrote a book called A Summons to Life. And it captured uh, what sociologists call the operating variables. And Sister Fatah, and so what she did was equip me to understand what it takes to reach young people. So I went around the nation the next year, and I went into communities, and I sought out people like her. Traditional social service outreach programs, when, when they're looking for solutions, they, they don't look for solutions. They come into low-income neighborhoods, and they ask, questions about deficiency. They want to know how many people are raising children who are dropping out of school or pregnant who are in jail. They call them needs assessments. I call them failure studies. I don't believe you can learn anything from studying failure except how to create it. And so what we did from the lessons I learned from Sister Fatah is I went around the nation and I looked for other people that young people turn to in times of crisis. And then I brought them together from Puerto Rico, from uh, Puerto Rican gangs, leaders, ex-gang leaders. I brought them together in, Phil in Washington, D.C. for three days. And I asked them to bring the fruit of your work. And so they brought these young people whose lives had been transformed by these adult leaders. And we sat around a, a table. And for three days, these young people poured out their explanations as to what transformed them, what changed them, why they were not afraid of the police or going to jail or even dying. 
how they were uninterested in social programs of uplift or therapeutic intervention did not reach them. Young people are, uh, what, I, what I have learned, young people have to be inspired to change. And they have to be inspired not by advocates, by people in their lives who are witnesses to them that it is possible to be transformed even though your environment doesn't change. Another mistake we make is assume that we have to change the environment in order for a person to change. No, if you transform the person, the person will transform the environment. And so, so the young people that we learned from them, and I did a second book called Youth Crime and Urban Policy. And Vanderbilt Law Review gave it a six-page positive review, not because Bob Woodson is such a scholar, it's because I listened and stayed out of the way and let the young people express for themselves what transformed and changed them. And so the Violence Free Zone, the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, philosophical and ideological roots go to this, this background of first going into low-income neighborhoods and finding out from the real experts what it is that transforms and reaches the heart of a person. They are not rehabilitated, they are transformed. <coughs> Means they are a new person because they are inspired by somebody. Kids, when I say a witness, there are two types of witnesses. There are those who have suffered the same challenges that young people have, have suffered. They have from dysfunctional homes where mom was a drug addict or dad's on crack or in, both parents are in prison. But they refuse to be defined by their roots. And they overcame these and therefore they are a powerful witness to other kids just because you're in a drug infested neighborhood, you don't have to be of it. Just because you're in a dysfunctional family, you don't have to be of it. Because I am a witness that you can change and, and become transformed. The second type of, of, of person in that environment that's influential are people who never succumbed to drugs or became predatory, but still resides in the same cultural and geographic zip code because they love of the kids and love is what they need. And they need people who are unafraid. And so what we have done at the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise is we have cultivated this understanding that young people in order to be transformed have to be loved. A psychiatrist is no substitute for a friend. And so, so what we have done now, we have taken this knowledge of grassroots leader, and we have applied it to the reduction of youth violence. And, the, and, and, and I'm gonna let Kwame Johnson come up to give you some details as to how we are, we only go into the most crime ridden, the most violent schools and communities, because we don't want anybody to accuse us of creaming. So we go in and within three months, we're able to reduce violence by 25 to 30% in three months. And why? Because going back to my original premise about the small, if you have a community of 1,000 people, those 1,000 people are controlled by 10%. And that 10% by 10%. If you're able to go in and exercise control in a school setting by reaching the right people, and you transform that negative leadership so it begins to have a positive, then you can affect the whole school system. And uh, I'm gonna ask Kwame to give you more details about how we were able to do this. Let me just con conclude my remarks by giving you an example uh, that you will see in, in the video. But we went into an area to test this whole uh, theory we went into an area called Benning Terrace in Washington, D.C. We had 53 murders in the five square block area in two years because of a warring factions avenue in the circle. And uh, it, you'll see it in the video, but a 12 year old was killed. And as a consequence, it embarrassed the police department and it was on made headlines around the nation. Well, I recruited grassroots leaders, five of them, and I won't tell you the story, I'll let you see it. 
But as a result of them going into that community and bringing these young people into my office downtown, the warring factions, we have not had a crew-related murder in 13 years in that community. By applying this soft approach of recruiting the leaders, and I'll let Kwame explain to you how we do it and how the Violence Free Zone program started as it has, the, I gave you the history, Kwame now will come up and explain to you how the Violence Free Zone program worked.